Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Bible study. It's so good to be here with you today. Uh, again, what we're doing here together is just spending a little bit of time each week uh, looking ahead at our Sunday and Saturday night readings for worship. And so today we're going to be primarily in the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, that's where we'll spend most of our time, chapters 5 and 6. But also we're going to begin in Psalm 150. So I, I think 2 Samuel 5 and 6, uh, it is a, a reading of joy. It's a reading of celebration. You you close those two chapters, so at least the portions we're reading, and there's a lot to celebrate, uh, a lot to to be joyful about. And that's also really clear in our reading from Psalm 150. So uh, you might be aware that the book of Psalms is not just some random collection of ancient prayers and poems, but there's actually an order to it. Uh, God's people long ago very clearly and intentionally arranged it. And uh, the easiest way to see that is to notice that in your Bibles, you, you might notice after certain Psalms that uh, it'll I'll mention the end of book one or the beginning of book two. In fact, uh, the book of Psalms is composed of five books uh, that come together to form uh, the whole. And so Psalm 150 is the complete end of the, the book of Psalms, the last Psalm of the last of the five books of the last Psalms. And uh, it's a beautiful Psalm. And it's a fitting way to end the Psalms. It's a, a Psalm of praise and, and joy and celebration. So let me get it up here on the screen for you. This is uh, what, the, what the Psalm says, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power, for his surpassing greatness. And then it goes on to, to list how we praise God with all of these instruments. It's a, a beautiful picture of God's people celebrating in worship together as the church. And it ends by saying that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Uh, I, again, it is a, a psalm of, of celebration. And so I guess I, I guess I want to ask you as we begin our study today of Psalm 50 and and mostly 2 Samuel 5 and 6, what is bringing you joy this week? Uh, I hope that there's something. I hope that you can see God's blessings in your life one way or another. And if you can, I, I hope that together we can say thank you to that, right? To not just take it for granted or shrug our shoulders at the gifts that God has given, but to, to give him the praise of Psalm 150. You know, our faith is not just meant to be some dull drudgery that we just kind of slog through through life, doing what God wants us to do is just to keep him happy or to keep him off our, our back. No, no, God has joy for us. And if we've been following Jesus for a while, maybe we take that for granted. I, I hope that we don't. Uh, just the joy that God wants for us, that he has for us in eternity, and that he wants to pour out upon us today. Now, uh, truthfully, maybe your week is not a week of joy. Maybe you have been facing some hardship. And so I don't mean to force joy up upon you. And I, I guess the beautiful thing about our faith is that it embraces all of our emotions, right? None of it is off limits. Uh, God welcomes uh, all of it, right? Invites us to bring all of it, the good and the bad, to him. And we will face some tough times in life. And so if that's where you're at today, uh, Bring that to the Lord by all means. But I hope that you can find a reason for joy, that you can see God at work. And if you can, to give him the, the thanks and praise that he deserves that we see in Psalm 150. Um, but again, let's turn, uh, turn our attention now to uh, 2 Samuel 5. Let me pull that up for myself. And uh, we'll take a look at what God has to say to us there. Uh, let me just read for you uh, a little bit of what it says. It says, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. Now, uh, maybe we can pause there. Uh, I tend to think that if the Bible is mentioning a place, it's worth paying attention to, <laughs> right? Uh, many times those names won't mean much to us, but they, they meant something to the author, right? And they, they, they put those little places in there as markers and notes for a reason. And so it's, it's good to just kind of think back of nothing else to remember maybe what else God has done at Hebron or what he will do uh, later in the story. And so actually, Hebron is a pretty important place in, in the Old Testament. It's where uh, Abraham spent some time. Um, he actually experienced a theophany, a, a vision of God at Hebron. Um, it's also where Sarah uh, died. She died at, at Hebron and was buried there. Um, 
Abraham himself was also buried there as well. And uh, this is where our story begins. And David uh, gathering his people at Hebron. It's been a special place in the history of Israel. And so uh, maybe no surprise that we find ourselves back there. Um, let's, let's keep going a little bit. Uh, so all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. Uh, we should probably note that uh, Saul, uh, King David's predecessor, has passed. And so now it's time for David to assume the throne. And he's been acting as king for a little while, but now it seems like it's all becoming official. So he gathers the tribes of Israel. All the tribes is important, not just some of them, but all of the people of Israel are coming out to him. David is uniting his kingdom uh, like, has, like never has been done before. So all the tribes come to him and they say, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. So even while Saul was king, David, it was you who was winning us our, our battles. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. Now that's interesting because in, in the Old Testament, uh, kings are not generally described as shepherds. Uh, but here David is. Uh, maybe a clue that there's something a little bit different about David. That he's not like the king who came before him, Saul. He was not much of a shepherd uh, in that sense. And not like so many of the kings who will come after him who rule with violence and faithlessness. Uh, but David is a, a shepherd king. He was a literal, sh literal shepherd, of course. That's where he started. Uh, but now he's going to continue that shepherding role even as king. And I think that means a lot of things, right? It means that he cares and provides for his people. He's not just some heavy-handed ruler. He, he loves his people as a shepherd loves uh, the sheep. And uh, here's actually where we might get... Uh, our first glimpse, at least in our reading today, that there's going to be a lot of similarities between David and Jesus. Right? Uh, David uh, is a, a, little, a little glimpse ahead of who our Savior will be. It's not that Jesus is merely David 2.0. Uh, Jesus will actually be the one that David never could be. But when you, when you read the stories of David, you're getting a little glimpse ahead of what's coming in a much fuller, much bigger, much more eternal, permanent, perfect way in Jesus. And so just some of the similarities you might know already, right? Uh, uh, David was from Bethlehem, just like Jesus was. Uh, they were both shepherds, right? David was a literal shepherd, shepherding sheep. He was also a shepherd as king. And of course, Jesus uh, is described as the good shepherd, the best of, of shepherds. Uh, we know that they were both mighty in battle. Uh, David brought victory to his people, just like Jesus brings victory over our enemies of sin, death, and the devil. Uh, David would be king over a united people. He came to unite Israel, all of these scattered tribes, into one people, just like Jesus comes to gather his scattered people into one eternal family. Uh, David was anointed as king, kind of set apart for the special task, just like Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit as his baptism, set apart to live and work as Messiah. Uh, we're we're going to uh, hear today that uh, a little bit later, let me pull that up for us that David was 30 years old when he became king. Well, uh, we know from the Gospels that Jesus was about 30 years old when he started his public ministry, uh, walking the, the roads of, of Galilee. We know that David is described as a man after God's own heart. Of course, that's true of Jesus as well. And it's David who works to restore God's presence in the midst of his people. And we're going to hear that story a little bit later today uh, when he brings the ark to Jerusalem, the center of God's people, their new capital. And that's just like Jesus who came uh, to bring God's presence into our midst, not in a physical place, but in the midst of his church, in the midst of each one, every one, one of us, right? Jesus lives in us, restoring God's presence. Jesus is Emmanuel, who came to restore God's presence on earth, uh, very similar to how David sought to restore God's presence by bringing the ark, the symbol of God's presence, back in the middle of, of God's people. So a lot of similarities. We're just getting a few glimpses already of a few of them between David and Jesus. Uh, but let's go oh, back a little bit, uh, verse 3, if we can, here. It says, When all the elders of Israel had come to David, King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. 
and they anointed David king over Israel. There we go. He was anointed. Again, David was 30 years old when he became king. He reigned for 40 years. 40 is often a, a number of completion or fullness, right? You might recognize that. Your ears might ping when you hear 40, right? Think about Israel wandering for 40 years in the, the desert. Uh, lots of 40s. Je Jesus in, in his own desert wandering for 40 days being tempted at the end of that. Uh, but then in Hebron, David reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Uh, all right. Uh, if we just pause there, already we're seeing that we have uh, a lot to celebrate, right? We said that this was a, a story of celebration and joy. We have a good king who is ruling in, in a better way than Saul had. He's a shepherd. He's set apart by God. He's, he's anointed. We have a united people, right? This is all, all good, good news for us. Uh, there's a king who's reigning and ruling, who's restoring the, the presence of God. Uh, now, the second part of our reading comes from chapter 6. So we're going to skip ahead uh, a little bit and uh, talk about what happens there. So if you want to flip open your Bibles, that's where we'll continue. 2 Samuel 6. It says, David again brought the ark together, brought together all the, I'm sorry, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. So again, this is a story of, of David bringing the, the place of God's presence, his ark, to, to Jerusalem, uh, back uh, to the middle of his people. He's moving the ark, in a sense, to an honored position. Uh, the ark had been at Baal, Judah, a city that was long associated with foreign gods and idol worship. And so David is honoring God by bringing uh, the ark away from that place that has become corrupted uh, to the capital and the future home of the new temple. Remember, the temple hasn't been built yet. It doesn't really seem like the tabernacle has been functioning very well at all from, from what we can tell. And so David is honoring God and bringing the ark back. Uh, lots to rejoice over. Again, we have a divinely anointed king. We have the presence of God restored and celebrated among the people. Uh, let's just read a little bit more, verse 3, because uh, it does go on a little bit. So it says, They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Ab Abinadab, which is on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it, and David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Now, just take a note of all those uh, instruments, because do you remember our, our psalm that we read earlier? Uh, a lot of those are right there, right? Clash of cymbals, timbrels, and strings, and pipes, harps, and lyres. Uh, psalm 50 is a, a reflection of the joy that we see in 2 Samuel 6. A lot to celebrate today. Uh, some readings of, of joy. And as I was thinking about 2 Samuel 5 and 6, two uh, New Testament uh, verses came to mind for me. And the first was John 5, 39 to 40, where uh, Jesus talking to some religious leaders and he says, he says to them, you search the scriptures, you read your Bible, and particularly probably the laws of God. You read the laws, you read your Bible, because you think that in them, in the laws and the rules and following uh, uh, putting a mark through every T and dotting every I, you think that by reading your Bibles, you, you can gain eternal life for yourself. Uh, but Jesus says it is the Bible, it is the scriptures that point to, to me. Uh, the problem with the religious leaders isn't that they were reading their Bibles too much <laughs> or trying to be too faithful. No, they were trying their best to be obedient, faithful people. The Pharisees, for sure, they were trying to do that. The problem with the Pharisees uh, is that they were reading the Bible, but they didn't see that Jesus was the fulfillment or the culmination of the Bible. And so Jesus is saying the whole thing from Genesis onward is all about him. If we think that the Old Testament and the New Testament are these two disconnected stories, right? We're, we're, we're not reading it correctly. It's all about him. And so I think that came to mind today because I, I think that 2 Samuel 5 and 6 are pointing us to Jesus. His name isn't on the pages, right? You won't find the name Jesus and 
the book of Second Samuel five or, or six, right? But it's it's clear that these stories are are leading us to to him and and pointing us to him, to a king even greater than David, one who could do what David actually never was quite able to do, the, the one who would restore God's presence among his people by sending his, his spirit, right? Even this Old Testament story happening hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus is ultimately all about him. And Jesus reminds us that we are to read the Bible with him, him in mind. Again, we won't always see his name. There's not always going to be some direct prophecy that we can draw a straight line to, right? But all of the scripture is leading us to Jesus, creating a longing, a stirring in us, a, a hope for the Messiah, so that when he comes, we're ready and prepared. Uh, another verse that, that came to mind for me came from uh, John 2, 18 through 20, where some religious leaders come to Jesus and they say this. They say, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What is Jesus saying there? He's saying, look, uh, the, the temple had been the place where God's presence dwelled amongst the people. It had been the place that you could go to know that God is there, that he's with us. Well, now that presence, that confidence, that assurance is found not in a building, but in Jesus, the one who lives in each of us, the one who comes amongst his church. And so, uh, again, Second Samuel 6 is, is David restoring the presence of God to the midst of the people. And what is that doing? It's pointing us ahead to Jesus, in whom that presence rests fully and completely. Even in this Old Testament story, we're, we're learning about Jesus. We're getting a little foretaste of him. And we're remembering that we today have a lot to celebrate, a lot to be joyful over. If you're struggling today to find something to thank God for, I pray that that would be it. That God is here, that he's amongst us, that he's your king. He reigns and rules, not as some heavy-handed leader, but as a shepherd who loves you. Well, uh, thank you all for joining today. Uh, hope that you've been blessed by this time. Hope you're a little bit ready and prepared for Sunday. Hope to see you there in worship. God bless you.